Good evening. Thank you all for coming. I'm Felicia Landrier. I teach theater history at UMKC. And the title of my talk is Renaissance Honor versus Fake News. <laughs> a horrible thing happened to me just last week, and I want to use it as a loose analogy for what happens to the innocent young hero um, in Much Ado About Nothing. I was in my office trying to catch up after having been out of town when a call came in. Dr. Londre, I'm returning your call. I did not know this person and I had not made any calls from my office for two weeks. Um, so I told him that. And as soon as that call ended, another call came in and then another and another. And since I rarely get calls at all on my office phone, I figured something was wrong. So I um, called the UMKC's technological services. It turned out that I was a victim of something the federal communications system calls phone spoofing. Some anonymous person or illicit business was using my UMKC phone number to make whom it knows how many calls, all in the 816 area code, under my UMKC phone number as a way of getting people to answer the phone and then to hear the swindler's recorded message. Over the next few days, I got over 400 calls from people who hit, simply hit the redial button um, on their caller ID and they heard my recorded greeting. Several of my callers um, said they got a threatening message about paying their student loans, even though they had never had a student loan. Of course, a bad guy could not profit from those who hit the redial button, so there must have been thousands of other people who either ignored the call or who fell for the scam by calling a number in the student loan recording. For a while on the first day, I answered the calls that came in to me and explained the situation. Most people were kind and expressed sympathy for what was happening to me. Even one gentleman who said I had called him about a hundred times that day. Um, but my phone never stopped ringing, one call on top of the other, and I lost a whole afternoon of work. The next day, my voice mailbox was full of messages and the calls continued until UMKC Information Services finally put an explanatory recorded greeting on my phone for me and diverted the calls to a voice mailbox. Since then, the calls have gradually tapered off. In fact, I got only one today. <laughs> what happened to me through modern technology relates to one of the narrative threads in Much Ado About Nothing, a play that abounds in instances of false pretenses or identity theft, beginning in Act One, when one masked character um, is uh, speaking for another during the masked dance. Two aspects of the phone spoofing repercussions made it seriously stressful for me. First, there were a few callers who left viciously cruel messages. One man cursed me and said he was going to have me arrested. Another man unleashed a string of screaming obscenities, and some played vulgar noises. <laughs> the parallel development in Much Ado About Nothing would be when Claudio humiliates and repudiates his bride hero at the altar. The shame causes Hero's own father to wish her dead. The second point of stress in my situation, like that of Hero, is that there was absolutely nothing I could do about my victimization. We couldn't trace the bad guy. How many thousands didn't call me back, but went on thinking that I would be behind a nuisance sales call like that? Another common feature of Hero's slander and my stolen phone ID is that the perpetrator has no regard for what he or she is inflicting on another human being. The play's villain, Don John, goes to great lengths to steal Hero's identity by manipulating Hero's personal attendant, Margaret, to come to Hero's window and exchange salacious chatter 
was Don John's paid henchman, Boracchio. In the dark of night, the noble aristocrats, Claudio and Don Pedro, cannot see the woman's face at the window and don't realize that they have been duped into thinking that it's Hero on whom they are eavesdropping. Don John has no good reason to destroy the reputation of a sweet young woman, except perhaps that doing so smirches the honor of his rival brother, Don Pedro, as well as the honor of Hero's father, Leonato, and her potential husband, Claudio. Don John, like the despicable Iago in Othello, is uh, whom Coleridge labeled a motiveless malignity is basically bad for the sake of being bad. Yes, there were gratuitous evildoers in the Renaissance, just as there are still evildoers among us today. Far too many who have no compunctions about harming others in ways that range from inconvenience to uh, major suffering and life setbacks. The false accusation against Hero is the emotional peak of Much Ado About Nothing. And it's awfully devastating for a play that is categorized as a comedy. I've used the example of my own recent ordeal to put a contemporary spin on what happens to Hero. But now I'd like to explore her situation in its original Renaissance context. Fresh from a military victory, the Prince of Aragon, Don Pedro arrives in Messina with his entourage for some R&R. The local governor, Leonato, is honored to have them stay at his palace. Leonato is even more honored when the prince's protege, Claudio, falls for his daughter, Hero. Leonato sees that Claudio is a count and an intimate of the prince, and therefore an excellent catch for his daughter, Hero. Claudio experiences love at first sight when he sees Hero. It's true, Renaissance poets believed that love could strike instantly, just the way we flip on a light switch. Love, as celebrated by Renaissance poets, entered through the eyes, and sometimes even made its way to the heart. In Renaissance terms, it adds to Hero's personal charm when Claudio learns that she is Leonato's only child who will someday inherit her father's fortune. A special attraction for Claudio as a Renaissance aristocrat was the fact that Hero doesn't talk much. <laughs> the first word Claudio uses to describe Hero is modest. In Act Five, when Claudio realizes the truth about Hero, he remembers his first sight of her, and he exclaims, Sweet Hero, now thy image doth appear in the rare semblance that I loved at first. As a Renaissance beauty, Hero would be all unassuming sweetness with downcast eyes. The fact that our production makes her into a livelier and more warm-blooded participant in the festivities, probably underscores a Me Too connotation for contemporary theater goers. That is, the way a woman dresses or behaves should not be seen as an invitation for a man to take liberties with her or allow him to jump to conclusions about her. At the mask dance in Act One, Claudio is all too easily swayed by the false rumor that the masked Don Pedro is wooing Hero for himself. Claudio's acceptance of that malicious gossip about his superior officer Don Pedro suggests that however bravely Claudio conducted himself on the battlefield, he remains immature in his personal relationships. Hero, as the object of the wooing, has little to say about whether she gets a prince or a count as a husband. In aristocratic circles, it was standard practice to marry for social advantage. If 
love awakened? That was a bonus. Honor was far more important than love. In a marriage contract, a man's honor became tied to the woman's virtue. If Hero is not virtuous, then Claudio's honor, as well as that of Don Pedro, who negotiated the marriage, would be shamefully compromised. Loss of honor, or good name, would make it virtually impossible for a man to face the world or to interact with other gentlemen. The vital importance of honor or reputation is what precipitates the men's rash treatment of Hero when they are led to believe that she is not a virgin. By today's standards, Claudio's and Don Pedro's cruel treatment of Hero would undoubtedly be condemned in terms of so-called toxic masculinity. We, the woke generation, <laughs> can see that these men are living by a double standard that allows them to play around while women's choices are restricted to preserving their worthiness for the man. Still, it's important for our appreciation of the play to acknowledge the very different Renaissance mindset. Claudio feels personally violated when the scene he witnesses in the dark contradicts the ideal vision that had sparked his love for Hero. When Hero is accused of having had vile encounters with a man a thousand times in secret, three men suffer blows to their honor. Her fiancé Claudio, his superior Don Pedro, who arranged the marriage, and Hero's father Leonato. When the shame is made public at the intended wedding ceremony, it's too late to question Hero's gentlewomen, Margaret and Ursula, about whether any sexual encounters would even have been possible, given the women's shared bedchamber and Hero's inability to go anywhere without their knowing it. Lately, we have seen in the news how easy it is for malevolent hackers to steal celebrity photos <coughs> from Apple iCloud accounts and seamlessly Photoshop the victims' faces into compromising photographs that easily get disseminated, disseminated to the unsuspecting. Whether it's phone spoofing, identity theft, or facial recognition hacking, this is the contemporary equivalent of what happens in Much Ado About Nothing. Lurking under the cover of darkness, the men rashly trust what they have been told they were going to see. Although they can't see the faces in the dark, the false report is confirmed in their minds by their hearing of the staged encounter. Like today's consumers of irresponsible reporting in the media, Claudio and Don Pedro should know enough to double check for some corroborating evidence. But why does Claudio denounce Hero so humiliatingly at the altar instead of going quietly to Leonato to break off the betrothal? Well, first of all, Claudio's immediate reaction to what he heard in the dark hits him like a murderous blow. He is reeling from the total destruction of his personal sense of self-esteem. His manhood and all of his military honors mean nothing if he is no longer worthy to play cards with other aristocrats. That is how pervasive the code of honor was. So Claudio's dastardly preconceived plan to denounce his bride in front of everyone surely erupts from the subconscious impulse to get revenge. Factored into that impulse is Claudio's own immaturity, which already became evident at the mask dance. As a count and a close friend of the prince, the self-righteous Claudio does not need to concern himself with sparing the feelings of a mere governor's daughter. 
After all, Claudio and Hero had scarcely spoken to each other. In Renaissance terms, their bond was a commercial transaction. And in Claudio's view, she turned out to be a worthless commodity. So why is Hero still willing to marry Claudio after his callous treatment of her? Apart from the fact that women had little choice in the matter, the crucial factor is that marriage to the man who had shamed her serves as a public cancellation of the stain and restores the reputations of all whose honor was vested in her. Defiled by slander, which was in effect the same thing as actual physical defilement, Hero had to die and be reborn for the redemption of her good name. Moreover, her apparent death helps Claudio to understand how a rush to judgment can cause serious damage to both the accused and the accuser. One of the strengths of this production is the depth of Claudio's deep remorse when it hits home that he has destroyed an innocent life, that he apparently caused the death of one who truly loved him. Leonato has the grace to forgive Claudio, but Leonato still needs a public restoration of his own honor and to achieve that, he creates yet another deception. Leonato gets Claudio's promise to marry the daughter of his brother Antonio as a substitute for Hero. So, in a way, it's another identity theft. <laughs> Claudio binds himself publicly to the veiled woman as a voluntary sign of admission that he had wronged Leonato when he falsely accused Leonato's daughter. The lifting of the veil to reveal Hero herself is her moment of resurrection. As Hero says to Claudio, one hero died defiled, but I do live, and surely as I live, I am a maid. Leonato underscores the point. She died, my lord, but whiles her slander lived. In a sense, Hero's apparent death allows them to bury the unpleasantness of the past and begin a new life together. Since Claudio has gained maturity, he has learned from his credulous acceptance of fake news planted by Don John that things are not always what they seem. Although I have focused on Claudio and Hero, most people remember Much Ado About Nothing for its more feisty, romantic couple, Beatrice and Benedict. Their running battle of wits, a merry war betwixt Beatrice and Benedict, includes some rather nasty jibes. Those two are definitely not what we today call snowflakes. <laughs> that is, young people poised to take offense at words or ideas. Indeed, Beatrice and Benedict so much seem to enjoy baiting and provoking each other that we suspect they are unconsciously in love with each other long before they are tricked into falling in love. Their relationship, like that of Claudio and Hero, is tested and cemented by fake news. That is, everything changes for them when their friends trick each of them separately into believing that he or she is secretly loved by the other. In the case of Beatrice and Benedict, the deception brings positive results, and this plot strand allows us to call the play a comedy. But the potential for a tragic outcome is close to the surface. And that seriousness impinges even on the Beatrice and Benedict story. Beatrice and Benedict have scarcely confessed their love to each other when Beatrice tells Benedict to prove his love by challenging Claudio to a duel. If Benedict would kill his friend Claudio in a duel over a lady's honor, it would restore that woman's reputation. But Benedict would be risking his own life. It could just as easily be Benedict who would end up dead. 
Beatrice's order is quite a burden for a man who has just dared to declare his love to her. On the other hand, for contemporary theater goers, Benedict too had been displaying some of that toxic masculinity. So it would probably do him some good to put his manhood to the service of a lady instead of swaggering about exchanging nasty cracks with Beatrice. The final release from the seriousness of the situation allows Beatrice to get beyond wishing she were a man and to accept Benedict as an equal partner. Yes, this play can be quite provocative in what it says about the age-old battle of the sexes, or what we today call breakdown of gender roles. <laughs> The play's contemporary relevance exists on many levels, but to return to my main point, Much Ado About Nothing is timely in showing the potential serious consequences of fake news and identity theft. In our modern world, real people get hurt by these Don Johns, these unscrupulous manipulators of technology. Knowing there will always be bad guys among us, what can we learn from the play to ensure that our own stories end as comedies and not as tragedies? The first lesson is not to impulsively accept what looks like evidence without seeking independent verification. And then we must be aware that the truth might sometimes be inarticulate or hard to follow as exemplified by Dogberry and his watchmen, who apprehend Don John's malicious operators, but can't make themselves clear to authority. And finally, there is Leonato in Act 5, counseling against assuming that only one's own way of thinking is the only right way. He says, is all men's office to speak patience to those that ring under the load of sorrow, but no man's virtue nor sufficiency to be so moral when he shall endure the like himself. Thank you. We have a few minutes left for questions, if you have any. Any questions <laughs> about the play or anything I said? Yeah. 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 Yeah set up their own criteria. Uh, so is it a masterpiece or not? Um, I would say on the other hand that uh, this is the first play in the 26 year history of the Shakespeare Festival that has been done three times. So uh, that would speak for the play being one that people love and can stand to see again. I think part of it is the timeliness of the, the message. Nebraska Shakespeare Festival is doing it this uh, even right now <laughs> as we speak. And, and other Shakespeare festivals are doing it. So I think that Battle of the Sexes theme is resonating nowadays. Any other questions? I've been spoofed as well. My phone number and I actually got one of those, ignored one of those phone calls and I hit, uh, I'm sorry I can't talk right now. And the guy whose number it really was texted me back and says, who is this? Yes. You've been spooked. Uh, yes, it was a harrowing experience for a day or two. <laughs> uh, I, and I hope you don't have to, any of you don't have to experience it, but, you know, <laughs> these things happen. Any other questions about the play? I know you're going to enjoy it. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.